Well, we're going to wrap up ecology, and we're also wrapping up to the midterm. So marine ecology is the last straight biology unit. Next uh, half of the course, we're transitioning to the local groups of life and then human influence, focusing on our uh, Tampa Bay environment. So marine ecology two, communities and ecosystem ecology will be the last uh, portion of the biology section. So communities. Communities study all of the different organisms in that particular habitat. So we're looking at how different species interact. Symbiosis means living together, predation, competition, mutualism, all these different relationships between the uh, different organisms. Uh, so ecology 101, well, it would be a thousand one uh, these days. When I was a college student, we, we only had three numbers. 101 meant basic. Interspecific means between, comp between um, species. Uh, the image below has an algae and a coral competing for resource space in this case. Uh, they're fighting for space and one will win. One will win usually. That's called competitive exclusion when one outcompetes the other. Uh, niches are an organism's role where it can be found. Uh, you look at the two barnacles there. The fundamental niche of the smaller barnacle is the entire intertidal zone, but it's outcompeted in the lower intertidal zone by the larger barnacle. If I were to scrape away the large barnacle, the small one would fill that niche. If I were to scrape away the small barnacle, the large one would not fill the niche because its fundamental niche, where it can live, is only lower in a title. So uh, we get layers of life based on their niches. Uh, fundamentals where they can live, realizes where they live when you factor in other organisms. So in its role where it sits in the ecosystems, uh, a role could be top predator, that's the niche. Uh, a role could be producers, and then where they can live. So we mentioned competitive exclusion. When organisms are competing for the exact same resources, if you remove all the factors, one will win and one will lose. Of course, there are limiting factors that allow many of them to flourish. Take, for instance, a predator. If a predator will eat multiple prey, it keeps the populations low enough so many can coexist. You remove the predator, and then one of the prey species will exclude the others through competitive exclusion. So competitive exclusion principle does not happen in a vacuum. When there's many different species, it allows for diversity. Symbiosis is organisms living together. And the most common is uh, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. A lot of biologists don't put predator-prey into symbiosis. I do because it's organisms living together. Uh, the populations help each other. I mentioned competitive exclusion. Predators eliminate that competitive exclusion principle, allowing many prey species to coexist. They also weed out the sick. They stop a, a prey species from overrunning a habitat. So although it's a negative on the individual, my outlook is predator-prey is a positive-positive relationship because the species as a whole benefits. So I uh, make a point to put it in with symbiosis and give it a plus-plus. Where commensalism gets a plus N, one benefits, one's neutral. Mutualism gets a plus plus, and then parasitism gets a plus minus, where one is harmed, the host. So predator prey, uh, boom and bust, boom and bust uh, curves are below. Uh, when one is booming, the other is busting. When predators on the incline, the prey species is on the decline. 
And then when it hits a low, the predators start to starve and decline, which means the prey incline. So you up and down, and they're out of sync. They're a little out of phase, but the populations follow each other, okay? So that is a predator-prey population curve. Commensalism is a plus N, plus meaning one species benefits, for instance, the barnacle, N means neutral, one species is totally unaffected, for instance, the scallop with a barnacle on its shell. Shell's external, there's no nerves. Presumably the scallop without a brain doesn't really know that it has a barnacle on it. Mutualism, plus plus, both benefit. Parasitism, plus minus, the host is harmed. The parasite benefits. What you see there, sea lice. Those are um, parasitic copepods, sea lice. So ecosystem ecology, uh, all of the abiotic factors factored in to your community. So an ecosystem is basically organisms in a given area with the abiotic factors and all of their interactions. That's what an ecosystem is. Large scale coral ecosystem. Uh, so it's a whole area full of diversity. The abiotic factors that are important, obviously water, light levels, temperature, pH, salinity, substratum or substrate, sandy, rocky, muddy, nutrients, Dissolve gases, pressure, tides, waves, intertidal exposure to air. So those are all abiotic factors. When you're studying an ecosystem, you need to know all of them. I try, try to ask you on your trip reports, describe your habitat, weather, temperature, you're not gonna measure the dissolved gases, but you should be looking at as many abiotic factors as you can when you're describing your ecosystem because that's what affects the distribution of life. So the range of tolerance, let's take for example the snook. I say snook need warm water, intolerant to freezing. They're more abundant in South Florida as you move up the coast because the water's warmer. A little less abundant, a little less abundant. Eventually, the population gets sparser and sparser to none. So as it's getting sparser, that's physiological stress. And then eventually none, intolerance. So the optimal range is where you get the most organisms. Now there are pockets of these snook, Crystal River, places like that, because in the summer when the Gulf is warm, they can move up the coast a little bit, and some of them get into these uh, estuaries, which always stay 72 degrees, and live there. And then, of course, as the Gulf cools, they move back south, leaving a few uh, residents, full-time residents, up in those areas. So um, that's what the range of tolerance mean. Temperature's one, salinity's one, pressure oxygen levels. There's many different factors that go into the range of tolerance. Uh, succession is the natural change of an ecosystem over time. Most succession we look at is secondary, the recovery of an ecosystem. Uh, primary succession is from scratch. Not many places from scratch nowadays, but there are some, you know, volcanic islands and stuff, but most are secondary succession. Um, and then when things are leveled off, that's called a climax community. Climax community is uh, the sustainable, stable, long established community of an area. So the climax communities in the ocean environment 
uh, the rocky intertidal, the kelp forest, coral reefs, cold seeps, and deep sea vents. So these are uh, spanning from around the world, some of the climax communities. Uh, the Rocky Intertidal Zone, there's a picture of it. Uh, California, New England, New England's got a lot of rocky. You can see low tide, the algae's exposed. It's rocky, so the algae grow on it. Cold water species. Uh, high tide, they're covered. You can see uh, they're zoned. They're zoned. The zones, uh, they have tide pools. Tide pools are the areas that, where the water never leaves. In this image, you can see that a lot of life is jammed into a small tide pool. Uh, the kelp forest is a community. A, uh, there's Alcatraz and there's the kelp forest between it, cold water community. Uh, those kelp can be 80, 100 feet long. That water is very deep, very cold. Uh, around the fringes, the sharks patrol because the seals and uh, sea lions and sea otters all use the kelp forest as their home. The coral reef communities, uh, there's a huge piece of grain, brain coral out, out in Largo. Uh, there's not just coral, coral, algae, they're shallow, warm, east coast, uh, very ecologically diverse communities. We are going to go in depth in each of these in the second half of the semester looking at all the biotic and abiotic factors and what lives there and look at the food chains and the food webs of these communities. These are just telling you examples of climax communities. Uh, deep sea vents, uh, totally dark without photosynthesis, using chemosynthesis uh, to power these climax communities at the bottom of the ocean near uh, cold seeps, cold seeps, uh, mineral water coming out or uh, mid-ocean ridge vol volcanoes, undersea volcanoes providing uh, heat and nutrients. So this is a bottom of the ocean climax community. Hydrothermal, hydrothermal vents. Uh, hydrogen sulfite comes out, it's metabolized by bacteria and that's a climax community, vent communities. Vent communities are found on the mid-ocean ridges. You can see by this image where they are, where they've been explored. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more. The bottom of the ocean is fairly inaccessible, as we all know. So those are the climax communities. We're going to look at energy transfer for now, uh, food chains, food webs, and biomass. Uh, chemosynthesis. We mentioned in the vent communities, the chemicals are used to split carbon dioxide and recombine it into your glucose, you know, the, the chemical reaction. Lights used in photosynthesis. Those are the two uh, chemical reactions that produce the carbohydrates that power our food chains. Uh, the autotrophs are the ones that do this. We also call them producers. Uh, heterotrophs depend on the autotrophs. They have to consume other organisms. So when you autotrophic, autotroph, producer, heterotroph, heterotrophic, consumer. Uh, the primary productivity, primary producers, uh, change carbon dioxide to carbohydrates. Base of the food chain. Uh, examples of our producers that we will see are the cyanobacteria, the marine algae, and the marine plants. So those are the major groups of primary producers. Uh, primary productivity is affected by the amount of sunlight, nutrients, water temperature. Those are the three main factors. Uh, we have a spring surge and a fall surge of productivity. So spring, you get a nutrient pulse from runoff. Uh, you get longer daylight, you get warmer temperatures, and then you have a nutrient pulse in the fall. And so you get two seasonal cycles. Around the globe, primary productivity 
is greatest in the cool water because cold water holds nutrients and oxygen better. It's greatest near the coasts. You can see uh, where it's green around the coast due to runoff, erosion. You get very little of it in the gyras because they're over the deep and they're nutrient poor and they're rather isolated. So primary productivity is greatest coastal, cold, least middle of the ocean, warm gyras. Uh, food chains start with sunlight or chemicals mainly. You get your producers. Uh, most producers are the phytoplankton, diatoms, dinoflagellates, crustaceans and other zooplankton are the herbivores, primary consumers, secondary eat them, tertiary eat them, quaternary eat them, top would be the last link, you would have the smallest number and smallest biomass uh, of the top. These things are not, if you get a top heavy, it topples because you would have too much predation and too little food. So the bulk of it, 90% is producer, 10% is consumer. Most are just food webs, though they're more intricate than a linear relationship. So food webs are just all of the relationships. Uh, they get sloppy. Food chains are far easier to draw. If I were to, uh, on, a, on an exam, I would say something like, give me a food chain for a seagrass bed. And you would have to dig back to the knowledge of seagrass beds and all the organisms that we saw and that we live there and make a linear relationship from your producer to your top. I would never ask for a food web, they get too tricky. 10% uh, of the biomass, 10% of the energy is transferred from one step to the next. That's why when they say eat lower on the food chain, you're more efficient. It's true. A half pound tuna sandwich would equal 10,000 pounds of biomass phytoplankton wise. You lose 10% every step. Uh, and then all the nutrients are recycled, they're looped. Uh, generally, they rely on living things, carbon, plants, animals, photosynthesis, respiration, uh, nitrogen, bacteria fix the nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, silicon, uh, rigid parts of the organisms along with your calcium cycles, the shells or the, the diatoms, the uh, Phosphorus cycle also, uh, a lot of guano and, and bird excrement has nitrates and phosphates in it, and they enter this uh, recycling quite, quite a bit. Uh, so nutrient cycles are generally bio-geochemical, bio-living, geo-earth, chemical, the nutrients themselves. And they revolve around the life cycles of various organisms. Uh, some special adaptations that we have in the marine environment. So wrapping up ecology, look at that. That's a, that's a brilliant picture. They're schooling and they're shiny, they're bright. So that coloration, distractive coloration, uh, the school moves in unison with the lateral lines, those fluid filled canals on the side that detect vibration. They uh, are safety in numbers. It allows them to reproduce that shark has ampullae of Lorenzini in it. It's detecting chemical and electrical pulses, uh, eyes pointing forward, torpedo-like body with rigid forked tail for speed. I mean, there's so many adaptations just in this one brilliant image. Let's uh, move through some of that. Um, what an adaptation is, is, is it's um, something that has been brought out by an evolutionary process to help an organism survive, size and shape, Coverings, extremities are all examples. Uh, this, take a look at it. You'll see uh, it again when you look uh, at your fish lab and, and trip. Uh, these are the morphology, structure, external morphology of the fish. 
familiarize yourself with the fins and the general uh, external anatomy, please. Uh, buoyancy. Buoyancy is important. We've mentioned these terms, the uh, adjustment of where you are in the water column. The chondrichthys have huge livers, taking up the largest organ, uh, organ in their bodies, a liver. Very oily, the oil is less dense than water, up and down the water column, adjusting its oil levels. Uh, swim bladder in the bony fish uh, produces gases, which are less dense than water, and up and down the water column, they move with their buoyant swim bladders. So they adjust their buoyancy via liver or swim bladder. Schooling, we mentioned schooling. Why do they swim in schools? To get smart, of course. Uh, no, bait ball takes the appearance of a larger organism from, from far away. You might be a little intimidated. Uh, easier to find food as a group, reduces drag with motion, protects fish from enemies, uh, distractive coloration. So a uh, lot of reasons why uh, fish school, birds flock. Counter shading, we mentioned that. The light underbelly, the dark top, helps blend in to your environment. Uh, sharks have that electrical uh, system. A, uh, ampullae of Lorenzini, fluid filled, detects ion levels. So they can basically uh, detect motion and ion levels. Of course, it confuses them sometimes and leads them to attack something rusty, but uh, all in all, it's a sixth sense that we do not possess. So can a shark smell a drop of blood from miles? Uh, maybe. They don't smell blood through their nose like we do. Uh, they are in water. They do have those ampullae, but they have to be the correct current. They would never be able to sense blood if the current was moving it away. So uh, it's a partial myth, partial truth. They don't sniff smell. Even though they do um, sniff smell a little bit, they, they don't have lungs to go up, but they actually uh, surface and test the air because of uh, when, when, when a whale carcass or something big dies, it fills with gases from decay and floats to the top <clears throat> and it reeks, it's rotten. Uh, the oils, aromatic decay uh, is carried on the breezes and a lot of times the shark can surface and detect the uh, chemical trail from, from breezes and follow it. So those are the uh, external nares, the, the nostrils, analogous. They don't really have uh, lungs, so, you know, they're a little different. <clears throat> they have uh, epithelium in there, which uh, is smell-sensitive, olfactory. <clears throat> they also have a lot of pores. So they do have a sense of smell, a little different from what we do because we breathe in the air. They have olfactory epithelial, which is tissue with the nerves that detect the chemicals in the water and even in the air. There you go, smelling the air. Uh, it's only a theory because sharks don't talk and they're not saying, whoo, it smells, but they tend to, uh, around carcasses, uh, move up and uh, try to detect volatile oils. <clears throat> volatile means they evaporate. These ampullae are a little fluid filled uh, with nerves and they detect the uh, concentration gradient of ions, electrical charges. <clears throat> the uh, ecological importance of this unique system is navigation, social behaviors, reproduction, anti-predators, seeking prey. So it gives them a leg up in all of those uh, ecological behaviors. That lateral line system that fish show uh, allows them to feel 
uh, each side, move in unison with their uh, schoolmates, <clears throat> avoid predation. Uh, that lateral line is prominent in the snook. That's famous. Its nickname is line cider because of those uh, deep lateral lines. Uh, some of the aerodynamics in that uh, fish's body, uh, you know, if they're torpedo shaped, they can move fast. If their belly's flat, they can sit on the bottom. Uh, you know, if they have an arched or humped in the back, they can live in streams. So uh, a lot of the body is shaped by the environment. Uh, the mouth as well, uh, you know, shaped on how they eat. A lower long uh, bottom jaw, like a snook, <coughs> can move up to eat. Uh, large jaw surround prey, like a grouper. Um, sucker mouth eats off the, the floor of, of the ocean. So, um, you know, the mouth shape also plays a part in its ecology. Coloration, we mentioned the counter shaving and the silvers, but you also have cryptic and uh, red because that red light uh, fades out first. So it helps them, uh, you know, hide. So there's a lot of the stripes or, or um, spots, false eye spot. Uh, a lot of times a predator will attack that thing and it's the head when it's really the tail and allows the prey to get away. Uh, the, um, the specks on the speckled trout help it blend into seagrass, which is uh, a spotty environment, it's disruptive coloration. So these, uh, the coloration has a lot of adaptation as well. Uh, reproduction, of course, uh, live bearing versus laying eggs, hiding eggs in, in vegetation, floating eggs uh, on the tides. <clears throat> so reproduction has a uh, lot of um, adaptation as well. Oviparous means egg laying. Oviviparous means holding the eggs in the body. Oh, some snakes are oviviparous. Uh, the seahorse, the male, actually is the one that holds the uh, the babies there. Uh, mouth brooders, oviviparous, and then viparous, live birth. Bioluminescence. Uh, most deep sea organisms make light, uh, so bioluminescence is an adaption in many many fish. The largest, longest fish, longest bony fish, just. Trivia Pursuit, what's the longest bony fish? Why, it's the oarfish. Uh, I see a Pokemon kind of looks like that. I can't remember its name, but it used to be taken for a sea monster and it is the longest bony fish, the oarfish. Uh, the most massive bony fish, the Mola Mola, the sunfish. It is the winner of the most mass. And it's got a puny little mouth because all it does is slurp up jellyfish. All right, the final, this is it, the final for the midterm, the final topic, that <clears throat> transition from fish to vertebrate, land vertebrates, seems to be achieved in the Sarcopterygii, the lungfish. They have the bone structure in their fins, they have enamel on their teeth, they have pulmonary and systemic blood flow. So the heart moves from two chamber to three chamber. They have legs with girdles, all, uh, you know, the, 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 the typical bone, the humerus, radius, all, all, all on the arm, the uh, tib, fib, femur in the leg, the pelvic and pectoral girdle, they use their swim bladder as lungs. So this tetrapod, four-legged land vertebrate, seems to have transitioned from our sarcops in the Devonian era. That's what the fossil record points to. Uh, so the transition from water vertebrate fish to land vertebrate and fib and beyond 
seems to uh, be the Sarcopterygii, the group of lobed fin lungfish.